Hello, everybody, and welcome. The topic today is an introduction to deaf culture. So I was born deaf, grew up deaf, completely deaf. I was a teacher for many, many years, and I also had a major and master's in linguistics. I've advocated for many years for deaf rights as well. I taught for over 35 years in various settings in the monthly community. I've, been ta I've taught with interpreters who are studying to become interpreters. I've taught people who are learning ASL. I've taught in advocacy settings as well. I've also been around the deaf community in a lot of different ways in terms of teaching and culture and such. Currently, I work at APSI as an ASL specialist. I look at different students and see what their needs are and where their skills are and see how I can support their continued language acquisition. A lot of times when families have a deaf child, it's a surprise to them and they're not sure how to proceed. So that's also a part of my role is supporting them in their process. I'll be honest with you, one hour is a very limited amount of time in order to really dig into deaf culture. So this will feel a little overwhelming for you because there's a, so much information that you could learn. We could do this for hours. I really encourage you after you're done here to just take a few courses and, and get into learning a little bit more about what deaf culture is. If you, for example, go to another country, maybe Italy, that's the best way to learn that culture. You can immerse yourself there and really see the language, see the people and get used to it. And this is the same idea. You really want to have that immersive experience. So I have seven points of discussion that I want to get into today, as you can see on my slide. And at the end, there will also be a question and answer period of time in which you can ask some questions. You can also put some questions into the chat and Marley will read them out. Again, like was previously mentioned, you will hear an interpreter's voice. You're currently hearing one. And this interpreter you'll hear for both the first half of the session and then you'll hear a new voice for the second half. You might notice there's a little bit of lay and that's because the interpreting process means we have to go through multiple people in order to get that message out. So those are just little things to think about during the presentation to be aware of. So I'd like to get into culture, identity, norms and values, behavior, language, social, socializing, social life and history, arts and literature, as well as filmmaking, and education. So for deaf culture, I really want us to think first about what is culture? What does culture mean to us? We really, we often tend to focus on things such as food and clothing and language. Those are visual indicators or auditory indicators of what exactly a culture represents and what makes up a culture. In terms of deaf culture, it's often seen as more of a hidden culture. Oftentimes, in Canada, we follow certain Canadian norms. However, the deaf culture has its own culture within that culture, which has a language, a sign language, and other such cultural norms that aren't the same. You cannot have a culture without language, just like you can't have a language without culture. There is a lot of different aspects of culture itself, such as language, uh, norms, history, traditions. And a lot of times you'll notice that deaf culture doesn't necessarily align with the culture of the majority. Just like if you went to Italy, you would notice that there is a different culture there. If you went to Mexico, you would notice that Mexico is a different culture as well. So you can go to those areas and immerse yourself in those cultures. But when it comes to deaf culture, you can find it everywhere. There are deaf people in every country. 
you'll notice that deaf people in Canada have that Canadian culture because they grew up or live in Canada, but they also have that deaf culture. So they're bicultural. If you have a French person who is deaf and they live in France, they would know French, but they would also learn LSF, which is French Sign Language. So they would have those two cultures ingrained in them. Our community is made up of deaf, hard of hearing, and CODA people. And maybe you're wondering what a CODA is. That, that's an acronym that stands for Children of Deaf Adults. Oftentimes when deaf people marry and have children, the children themselves are not deaf, they're hearing. It's very rare that deaf children are born to deaf parents. As well, another member of the deaf community can be considered to be interpreters who are well involved or go to events or involve themselves in the culture. There is not one universal sign language there are as many sign languages as there are spoken languages. When you picture spoken languages, you can think of Italian, Spanish, French. All of those languages are also, there are also sign language, signed languages in those countries as well. And they are not the same as English or the same as ASL. Is there any questions so far? And also, I really want to reiterate, there's no such thing as a stupid question. The important part is that people are curious and they want to ask and they want to know. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to hear them. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Hearing none. So a question just popped up, Jax. So the question is, where can I learn more about maritime sign language? That's a very good question. Maritime Sign Language, MSL, has a very interesting history. It's associated strongly to the Eastern provinces. It's in Halifax, it has been around here for many, many years. I'm going to say 1800s, 1830s, 1840s. There's a man from Scotland, I think another man from England moved here. One of their names was William. And I'm trying to remember the last name, can't quite remember. William Gray. And he moved here and he was a, a tailor. He was deaf, he signed. And then he moved to the area, realized there was no deaf school, discussed with community members locally, and they set up a house. And they worked on Scottish Sign Language. And they taught Scottish Sign Language and they're still finding out more information about the history of MSL from that and how that spread from that one little house. There was a school that was set up later, but it was more of an ASL based school. And so that influenced MSL significantly. So the number of native fluent MSL users is, is very low these days because of that influence. So that's some information for you. One challenge that we've had has been that there's two different perspectives on what is best for deaf children, as you can see here in my slide. I'm gonna briefly touch on the historical effects and how they came about. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, people lived on farms. It was very rural, very farmland focused. And then when the Industrial Revolution came along, it became much more focused on urban life, 
So many more people move to the city. There's more people being hired for manual labor. And those jobs tended to go to able-bodied people. So people who were deaf or blind or had mobility challenges didn't tend to get those jobs. And that sort of attitude has persisted over the years. That attitude as well has really influenced people's attitudes nowadays towards people with disabilities and people who are deaf. Oftentimes you notice there's a lot of buildings that are not accessible. There's a lot of focus on telephones, speaking through, through phones and audiological perspectives. And prior to the phones, deaf people and hearing people were equal because everyone could write. People wrote back and forth and that was a very common way to communicate. And then when that telephone technology came up, suddenly there was that benefit, that, that, uh, that unbalance started to take place. So you have the medical perspective. I've listed some pieces of that here. The deaf people need fixing, that it's a disability, that we should feel bad for them. This is, again, this is a very hearing perspective from hearing people about deaf people. A lot of times when people grow up and they don't have the experience of the deaf way of life. They're very used to knowing what they hear, following what they're hearing, not signing, and focusing on that auditory way of, of communicating and interacting with the world. So they think we have to help deaf people and how can we fix them? It's all about fixing how to change them instead of recognizing deafness as a culture itself. A lot of times too, sign languages are looked at as gesture, as action or pantomime, and they're not acknowledged as real languages. And then we have the cultural perspective, which is a, a more deaf-based perspective. Yes, we do have a culture. Yes, sign language is a language. Sign, it was recognized as a language during the 1950s. Prior to that, people didn't really realize that it was a language. We didn't even call it sign language. It was just signs. And then it became a language itself, and specifically ASL got the name American Sign Language. It was a new concept for people to really see it as a grammatical language as opposed to just gestures and mime, what people saw it as prior to that. So again, that cultural perspective has that that strong tradition of passing along these languages, our language, passing along the norms and values of the community. There's books celebrating our deaf culture and teaching people how to become more aware of language itself and how language develops, how the brain works cognitively and how it picks up languages. It's been fascinating to see the research about the ways in which ASL and other side languages are picked up and do become fluent and, and have their, their own process in the brain. So before I get into more about the language itself, is there any questions about any of that? Seeing nothing, we'll proceed. So during this presentation, I'm signing ASL. I have two interpreters interpreting from my ASL into English. But really, ASL came from French Sign Language, LSF. In Connecticut, in the States, there was a man named Thomas Gallaudet. And he himself was watching these children play and noticed that there was one young girl who was all by herself. So he asked the other children what was wrong with her while she was all alone. And they said she can't speak, she can't hear. And he was really, really touched by that. He thought, what's going on there? And so he approached that young girl and was trying to think of how he could communicate with her. They were in a sandbox. So what he did is he wrote out the word dog. He pointed to a dog, 
and I pointed to the word in the sandbox, and she picked it up very quickly. And Thomas Gallaudet really was was hooked. He wanted to be involved. This was during a very strong religious movement when people were very focused on how to help people. They really wanted to be involved and help people carry on with their lives. And it's... When Gallaudet focused on this, he talked to uh, that girl's father and, and it was decided that he would travel to Europe. So Europe, England specifically, is where he traveled to, through boat, by boat. They had a very strong oral focus. So they focused less on sign language. So he, he looked around the area, realized it was a very strong oral tradition, and wasn't sold on it completely. So what he ended up doing was going to France. And they had public education there. So all children went to school, deaf children could go to school as well. And so when he went into the school, he met a teacher who himself was deaf. So his name was Laurent Leclerc. Laurent Clerc, sorry, those are different. And he's got a very specific sign name on his cheek. You can't, uh, if you see me sign it, it's two fingers on the cheek and it represents a scar that he had which is an identi identifying feature of it. So he went in and, and realized that this deaf teacher was signing questions and getting the students involved. They were responding and signing as well. So Thomas invited him with him to go over to the States. Laurent agreed. And obviously I'm giving the Coles Notes version of this story, it's quite a long story. And it was a significantly long journey, I'm going to say 80, 83, some number of days that it was a, a very long trip. So during that trip, Laurent taught Thomas signing in French, LSF, and in return was taught how to write and read in English. So when they arrived, they set up a school in Hartford, Connecticut. It was called this School for the Deaf and Dumb. And at that time, dumb meant that they couldn't speak. And that's, it didn't mean the same thing it, it means nowadays. It had a different meaning, but that was the school that they set up, the first deaf school. It invited students from all over the Eastern states and they all congregated at this one school. And as they got together and signed and used their own signing, they actually developed ASL in that school. It was about 60% LSF, that French sign language, and the other signs sort of developed and into their own sign language. It has its own complex grammar, ASL, it's a fully visual science language, doesn't require any speaking, and is not the same as English. It is, many people think it is just a signed form of English, and that is not true. It is its own language completely separate from English. There are lots of different sign languages. There's Swedish, Danish, German, Scottish, Filipino, Arabic, a, a, a wide variety of sign languages around the world. Oftentimes, even within a large country, you can find smaller communities that have their own dialects and their own sign language. It's incredible the history that ASL has. It has a long and beautiful history to, to look into. Is there any questions about any of that, about the language? <laughs> 
right. And our next topic is identity. So you might see that there is a capital D, death. You think about it in terms of Canadian. When you're saying someone is Canadian, you use a capital C for Canadian. And that's the same idea with the capital D. It is a culturally deaf person. So they're using the capital D to represent that. The capital D represents a person who has embraced the culture and the language. The lowercase d just means a person who has hearing loss. They are deaf, but they perhaps don't follow the cultural norms or use the language and such. There are also people who are hard of hearing. They can hear some, and they can hear more than a person who might call themselves deaf. For example, they could use the phone. So maybe they could understand the television without captions. Those people who fall into that category of identity often identify as hard of hearing. Some of them can talk or do talk as well. There's also late deafened people. They grow up hearing and then they become deaf later on in life. At Gallaudet University, the first deaf president, his name is King Jordan. He was in a motorcycle accident when he was 19 and he became deaf as a consequence of that accident. There are also people who are deaf blind. So they're deaf and they're also blind. And we put those two, deaf and blind, together to create one word, deaf blind. That is one identity. There are many different people in the deaf community. It's a very diverse community. It's very rich in identities and rich in experiences. There are people who are Arabic, Mexican, Black, Spanish, Latino, et cetera, et cetera. There is also queer people, trans people, people of different religions. There are deaf children who grew up and they had deaf parents. And again, like I had mentioned earlier, many deaf children have hearing parents. So deaf children who had deaf parents had that exposure, that sign exposure from the beginning. So sometimes they have a bit of a different identity from deaf children who grew up and did not have deaf parents, they had hearing parents. You know, there's a lot, most organizations that work with deaf people and hard of hearing people will have that deaf and hard of hearing together. So you have both labels to try to encompass all of the different identities. You can learn more, you can see the website that I've listed here, the nationaldeafcenter.org. There's a lot of information. It's a really great website. It really gets more into deaf culture and it's free. You can sign up to take courses, learn about different topics. There's uh, presentations in English with captions, with voiceover, so on and so forth. And it's a really wonderful resource. I encourage you all to check out. Is there any questions about identity? So Jax, there is a question that came up. So as a classroom teacher, how can I, should I help my deaf student develop their deaf identity? What would you suggest? That is a great question. It's very exciting to see that question being asked. We have teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, my tenor teachers. And there's also an ASL specialist like myself, who we work together to provide resources to classroom teachers, to resource teachers who need them. There's lots of resources from college at university, from the deaf community, lots of events taking place. There's so many resources out there and you can use those resources and incorporate them in your curriculum. It's a way of really enforcing or encouraging that identity the same as you encourage all the other students' identities. There's also ways to bring guest speakers. You can bring in someone to teach a little bit of sign to the class so they can all learn together. 
in September, the third week of September, is the International Week of the Dead. So that week, maybe you could get in touch with myself, the ASL specialist, and you could come and, and do some sort of activity. Children really enjoy learning sign language. They really do. So it's a great opportunity to provide that to the class as well as that student. The key and the thing that is really most important, I find that oftentimes hearing teachers explain deafness to other hearing students. And that can feel not like that, like that deaf student is not involved or like they're separate somehow or being spoken about instead of being included in that discussion. So it's important to be able to incorporate an ASL specialist or another deaf person as well as as that student so that everyone can feel involved. You can have an interpreter interpreting. There are ways to go around that as opposed to sort of talking about deafness to other people when you yourself are deaf. We want, we want everyone to feel together and equal and, and like they're being acknowledged and recognized. It's very cool to be able to, to show ASL and show that this, this deaf student has their own language and, they can use English, they can use ASL, and they have that identity. And to be able to really emphasize that identity while also having that togetherness. Deaf people can absolutely learn English and become fluent in English. It's so important to also develop the ASL as well, so you can have both languages. I hope that helps. Did that answer your question a little bit? Hi there. So you're going to notice a change in the voice. So the interpreter has switched now. Okay, so no other questions. We're good to keep going. Okay, very good. So I'd like to move on to different labels that are used that is not currently uh, deemed acceptable by the deaf community. Hearing impaired is a common phrase that is used. That comes from a very um, hearing focused and it also focuses on someone's hearing status, uh, which is not something that's accepted within deaf culture. The word impaired also suggests that something needs to be fixed. And within the deaf culture, we don't accept that label um, that has been given to us. So uh, you would never find a deaf person describing themselves as hearing impaired. It is a very strong medical view though. So you might find in, in medical fields or in the hospital that they'll be using the word hearing impaired to try to make it more politically correct in a sense, to not insult someone. But I will say that if you ask any deaf person, they feel very comfortable with their identity as a deaf or hard of hearing person. And so that's something that would be more widely used by ourselves. And hearing impaired is something the hearing community has, has come up with. So certainly if you're not sure and you're not sure what to call someone, just ask the deaf person and see what they would like to be called. You will see in schools there will be a deaf person, which is called an LASW, which means Language Acquisition Support Worker. If you happen to see one of those deaf adults in your school, you can ask them and they can help you out to figure out uh, which title to use. Uh, there's also a phrase that's called sensory loss. That's quite vague. I've seen that coming up recently. Uh, that's something that's new. I, I again recognize it's people trying to be polite and respectful, uh, but again, deaf is, is a word that we're very comfortable with. Deaf mute is a bit of an old term. Um, we use a specific sign. There's a sign that we use to represent that older fashion concept. Uh, we point to the ear, which is showing that, and then using the sign for closed so that the ear is not functioning. Uh, but that's not a sign that's, uh, that we use now. <laughs> 
I'm not sure if any of you can actually see me, but I can show you that sign again if you'd like. So as I mentioned already, that's not something that we use anymore. Another phrase is deaf and dumb. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it represents someone who is, is unable to speak and, the, and dumb is the phrase that was used to describe that. Uh, it can be misconstrued often as someone who is unintelligent. So that's a phrase that we definitely avoid. The last one, that you will see there is hearing handicapped. It's a bit of a <laughs> shock when I saw that for the first time. Uh, it's a bit of a strange one. There are quite a few more labels that I, that I see, but these would be would be the main ones. We don't really have time to go into all of them now. So I hope this gives you a sense of again, as a deaf person, deaf and hard of hearing is the safest way to go. So I'm going to move on to cultural norms and values. Just check in again to see if there's any questions before I switch topics. OK, seeing none. Certainly one of the most important cultural norms that we practice would be um, that collectivism of getting together uh, socially. We have lots of events and, uh, and different ways that we get together in person, whether it be sports or we get together for a conference, we could get together to go camping. Uh, but just multiple ways of socializing uh, and the key is to be in the same space with each other. So that is something that is one of the key components of our culture. One of the biggest norms that we value would be eye contact uh, and maintaining that eye contact when communicating with someone. It's interesting as a hearing person, you have the ability to be able to look away, but still hear what someone is speaking about. Because ASL is a visual language, we must maintain that eye contact. So we definitely value maintaining the eye contact because if you look away, uh, that would suggest, if I looked away, that would suggest I was not interested in what that person was saying. So it creates a disconnect. So in sign language, we do maintain uh, that connected eye, eye contact with each other. Another important norm would be attention getting behavior. So how do you get a deaf person's attention? We recommend the tapping on the shoulder, uh, just the shoulder, I would say. That's, that's the easiest way to do that. A very light tap on the shoulder is a great way to get someone's attention. If you tap someone very urgently on the shoulder, that would suggest that there's an emergency and that you need me to look at you very quickly. I can give you another example. Say if you were in a movie theater or we were in a meeting where we were in rows, if you can picture the seating in a movie theater, you can also kind of tap someone down the line. So uh, if you, or you want to be able to see in the movie theater, you can also just, you know, we, we definitely don't want ever want to block anyone's view, so we can we communicate that with each other as well. So we most definitely have our, our own cultural norms and practices that we all are familiar with. If tapping someone on the shoulder doesn't work, you could uh, create a vibration by, by tapping your hand on the table. Uh, you could stomp your foot on the floor, which would create a little bit of vibration on the floor. Deaf people definitely love floors that are wood because if you stomp on a wooden floor, you can feel the vibrations throughout the room. If you're on cement, uh, you're out of luck. <laughs> so there's nothing you can do there. So if you are well behind a deaf person, maybe they're walking ahead of you, you can't yell to get their attention but you could get someone's attention who is farther ahead of you to say, hey, could you get their attention for me and let them know that I'm trying to get them to look back at me. So hearing people too also understand enough that if I'm trying to get someone's attention to say, hey, can you get them for me? And then they, they tend to recognize what it is. It's mostly gesturing saying, hey, get them to look back at me. And then from there, we as deaf people take care of it from there. 
So we definitely have a system, different ways to get in touch with each other. Uh, another good way to get the uh, room of deaf people's attention is to flick the lights on and off. Um, not repeatedly, one or two times is enough. <laughs> we don't uh, we don't also then keep them off for a very long time. That defeats the purpose. <laughs> so we can't see each other when the lights are off. So yeah, a quick flick of the lights is a, is a good way to get a deaf person's attention. Another example is if you came across two deaf people having a conversation, a signed conversation. You know, I will admit that we as deaf people enjoy the awkwardness as a hearing person tries to figure out how to get between us. Um, it's, they don't want to be rude and they don't want to insult anyone. But one really important thing in deaf culture that we're very used to is absolutely just walk through. It's completely fine to walk through. That may seem counterintuitive to your own hearing culture but it's much less disruptive to us if you just go right through. So if, you, if you're hovering nearby and don't know how to go through, we almost feel as though someone's eavesdropping and we're like, is everything okay? Is that, why are you hanging around here? Another funny thing that happens is someone will duck as they walk through a conversation. <laughs> so we'll stop what we're doing and watch them walk through. And again, we recognize it's people trying not to be rude, um, but certainly just walking right through is perfectly fine. So yeah, it's a, these are some of the rules that we teach. Uh, I, I've taught before to, to hearing students as I was teaching them ASL or in the interpreting program. If you come across two deaf people having a conversation, feel free to just walk right through if there's no other way around. One final example is if a deaf person goes into a restaurant. Typically, as you would know, if you go into a restaurant in the evening, the lights are quite dim. So if a waiter comes along, you know, it's, it's certainly very difficult for us to see them. It's difficult for us to see each other. So we, we like more well-lit spaces. Also at a restaurant, you'll often have a centerpiece. Maybe it could be flowers. And you'll notice that deaf people often move those out of the way or put them on the floor or something just so we can actually have an unobstructed view of each other. And that's just something that you will see. It's, it's a bit of a difference. If it's a hearing person that walks into a hearing environment or when a deaf person does, you, you, there's some different cultural things that will happen there. When an event is finished, it, uh, deaf people don't just say, okay, I'm out of here and then leave. Uh, it takes a really long time for a deaf person to, uh, to uh, make their way out of the room. There's a lot of uh, funny stories of children of deaf adults, CODAs, as I mentioned earlier. If they go to an event with their deaf parents, as the deaf person's trying to leave, they stop and they say goodbye to everybody who's there. So it takes an exceptionally long time uh, to leave and those CODAs definitely have complained about that. You know, if you, but as I mentioned, how it was so important that we all get together in the same room, this might be the only opportunity that we see each other for a long time. So we, we take that time to, to connect with everybody who's there. So that's definitely a strong part of our culture. And one other thing that we value highly is deaf children, because we recognize the importance of passing on that language and that culture to the next generation. Are there any questions from anybody? Okay, uh, I think there might have been a question typed out, but I can't see that. I did have a question. I had it typed out. Is it okay if I just read it out to you? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so what I asked was, can I get uh, more training as a classroom teacher to communicate with my deaf student? Um, learn the norms a little bit better 
Yes, that's a great question. I, again, am an ASL specialist and I work for APSI, so I can always be invited to support classroom teachers uh, with that work. Itinerant teachers are also a connection that you could have to us um, to make sure that uh, if a deaf person could come in and explain some of that uh, even further to you. So absolutely, we can help with that. Thanks. Great. I'm not sure um, how I can get my contact information to you. I'll have to figure that out uh, to get that out to you some way. I'll ask Nellie maybe at the end how we can get that information to you. Oh, okay, I mentioned you see you mentioned that I could put it in the chat. I can do that uh, at the end of the conversation at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I'll touch a little bit on um, socializing, networking, and and some of our history, um, just just very briefly. As we, as I've mentioned at the beginning, getting us together in the same space is very important so that we can communicate easily with each other. We have multiple events in the deaf community that happen. Uh, could be annually or biannually, conferences or sporting events. Uh, there's often national conferences that happen maybe every four years. There is a deaf women's conference that's happening uh, in a couple of years. It did happen in Halifax, uh, I believe it was uh, this year or last year, but it was for a full week. So there was an opportunity for deaf women from this area to get together and and have a conference. In Nova Scotia, there are uh, multiple agencies or, or groups uh, that keep us connected. Deaf Atlantic, for example, uh, I can certainly pass along some of that information to you as well. There's quite a list of organizations. There'd be a Deaf Darts Association, different sporting organizations. There are multiple groups that get together on a regular basis. We also have the Deaf Youth Association of the Maritimes. And so that's a connected group between uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland as well. And they get the deaf uh, young people together from this area. As I move on to arts and cultures, we have multiple, multiple groups. So uh, the first one that we, that we can see here is So what you see, the first one here is DVA or DVIA. So it would be deaf visual imagery artists. That's been an organization that's been going for quite a number of years, since the 60s or 70s. It's a group of deaf creatives who would get together and support each other with their art and their video productions. There's multiple media, so it could be painting, it could be video, it could be dance, music, et cetera. So it's a really diverse group and it's a way to showcase your art. Even it could be something like sculpture, painting, anything like that. There's a man called Chuck Bayard. He's an artist who creates drawings uh, that are overlaid, an image overlaid with the sign on the hands. So if, for example, the word lion, it would show a picture of a lion, but then there'd be a person who would be signing the sign lion over on top of the image. So there's beautiful art that he does. And that's just one very brief example of many deaf artists uh, that we have in the world. There's another type of art that we do, which would be say one to five art. So you can see the signs that we use for numbers. So it would be one, two, three, four, and five. And we can use that hand shape to create, to turn that, those numbers into verbs and create a whole story with that. So say, for example, if you were showing animals, you can use the number one to show an animal entering a space. You could show two to show that they're looking around. You could use uh, three, which then becomes little feet to show how feet move. You could use the number four 
uh, to say if it was say a cat showing that they could show their claws and then the five hand shape say if it was a group of birds you could show them all flying away so there's multiple ways that we like to play with sign language and and then it would become something artistic so asl literature is diverse and uh, it's very cool and there's a lot of different options that you can see when we use a phrase called deaf lit or deaf literature that would reference writing and sometimes films filmmaking recently has exploded uh, it's become very popular within the deaf community to represent our lives in film and if you think about that it makes sense since we're very visual people just recently, Netflix ordered two new documentaries uh, about the deaf community. We just found that out, so I'm not exactly sure when they'll be um, published for everybody to see, but uh, there's lots of deaf art that's happening right now. We have a locally made film, um, The Halifax Explosion, The Deaf Experience, that was made by a group of people in Halifax. And it was specifically speaking on the experience of the deaf community when the Halifax Explosion happened. There was also recently a 48-hour filmmaking competition in, in Nova Scotia where you had could make uh, a very short film with your phone, your iPhone. That was very cool. We had quite a number of members of the deaf community who participated in that. So if art is something specifically you're interested in, I can definitely provide you some more resources so you can see them. I'm seeing that our time is running a little short. So it's almost 1.55 at this stage. I think maybe I'll go down to education. I was going to speak a bit about Gallaudet University, but we may not have time for that today. If we go back in the history of deaf education, there used to be schools for the deaf. You might remember at the beginning I mentioned the man from Scotland who moved here and set up the first school for the deaf. And that's how MSL came to be, Maritime Sign Language. The last remaining School for the Deaf in Nova Scotia was in Amherst, and it closed in uh, 1995. And so what happened to those students who were in that School for the Deaf in Amherst, they all then became what we call mainstreamed. So they joined uh, classrooms in their home community uh, with other hearing students. That's part of the reason why my role came to be. Uh, I was hired as the ASL specialist last year, and we've just hired a second one who will be working with us in the fall. Because there are a lot of students in those mainstream situations who need our support when in their, in their education. One of the reasons for, for the mainstreaming uh, approach was to keep children in their homes, uh, but most of those families are hearing, so we do provide some of that additional support. There are two other things though I wanna make sure that I emphasize today. It is critical for deaf children to have language exposure and early intervention. There are most deaf children when they're born are born to hearing families and they don't know sign language when their child is born. Oh, it's a link I can't open. But this is a BICS. This means basic interpersonal communication skills. And that's something that all teachers I think should do. I think it's an important, important thing to learn about. Uh, it's very specifically related to language development and how we learn socially. There's lots of incidental learning that happens when there's a hearing person in the classroom. You just learn by what's around you in the environment. If there's a deaf person in the classroom, we have to be more deliberate with that exposure to make sure that that student is getting what they need. So there's another thing called CALP. And this stands for cognitive, academic, what's the LP, uh, language, the P is, oh gosh, I forget the P. <laughs> the P stands for something. But you can find that online. Uh, all of the information is there. I was hoping to open the link to be able to show you, but I can't make that work in my presentation here. But CALP is for um, education throughout a deaf person's life. Beyond graduation as well. So it's just uh, working, uh, focuses on supporting students in that way. So if you haven't gone through the BICS process first, uh, you're not going to be ready for the next step, the more academic learning 
So often what happens for deaf children is when they come into school, they haven't had that, that basic learning yet. And so that's why it's very important for me to work with parents when their children are babies to give them some of that exposure. Okay, so that is a very brief uh, overview of deaf culture. If you have uh, any more questions or, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer them if you wanted me to provide a workshop or go into more in depth. Definitely reach out to me if you would like that to happen. There's so many, so many things that we could touch on. So if you're interested in, say, having me come in and do a presentation, reach out to me and I can figure out how to best accommodate what you need and how to best support you and with keeping, of course, the, the needs of the deaf students paramount.